friends, greetings, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I'm your host, Pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado, registered pharmacist number 12275. I specialize in using nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your vitality, to your health and well-being, and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be, but you don't know where to begin, you have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more in control of your body, you are more and more knowledgeable, and you know you can overcome any health issue. That is why we're here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 29 years of practicing pharmacy, I've seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes and hypertension and obesity and skin diseases like psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, acne, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds. Recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle, but what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure. Because the human biological system is a healing system. It's a regenerating system. It is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment-to-moment basis. And while some folks may call that healing, renewing, regenerating system a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health or nutrition or prescription drugs, we welcome your phone calls on the bright side. Our number is 844-236-6010, 844-236-6010. If you have questions about health or nutrition or prescription drugs, if you want to get off your meds and get on a good nutritional supplement program, help a loved one, family member, workmate get off their medication and get on a good nutritional supplement program, we're here for you. If you have questions about the longevity products, ingredients, formulations, something you may have heard about or read about in the newspaper, We want to help you understand the world of nutrition. We want to help you change your life and help you change the lives of loved ones today as well. 844-236-6010 is our number on the bright side, 844-236-6010. If you're interested in purchasing any of the Longevity products or joining the Bright Side Ben team, please call the Bright Side Ben phone team at 866-735-2470, 866-735-2470. Love to have you on board. Love to have you on my team. For a one-time $25 fee, you can start yourself a longevity business, help spread the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program, and, of course, get your products at the wholesale price. 866-735-2470 is the phone number for the Brightside Ben team. You can also head over to my website, brightsideben.com, or my blog, pharmacistben.com, which we update regularly with news stories as well as blog posts, also criticalhealthnews.com, and you can sign up. Uh, right off the website, so you can click on the Join the Team link, or you can purchase any of the longevity products you hear advertised or recommended on the program right off the website. It's criticalhealthnews.com, brightsideben.com, and pharmacistben.com. If you're interested in purchasing any of my new Truth Treatment products, Truth Treatment Skin Health products, you can head over to truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. And we are talking skin health here. We'll be talking skin health for a little bit. A little bit longer, we're going to be addressing high aluronic acid, high aluronic acid later this week. And then we're going to talk about a little mysterious protein that very few people have heard about, but something you're going to be reading and, and hearing a lot about in the future as it relates to dermatitis and rashes, and eczemas, and dry skin. We'll spend a couple of days on that as well. Uh, that'll be here in a, uh, probably the end of the week. Take home message here when we're talking about skin health is that the health of the skin is the health of, of the body. Skin health equals body health. And when we talk about the skin, we're talking about the skin specifically, but we're really talking about the health of the body. That means if you, even if you don't have a skin health problem, these ideas that we're talking about for growing skin cells and keeping the skin healthy, looking healthy, uh, feeling healthy, being healthy, really relates to the health of the entire body system. It's impossible, with rare exceptions, it's impossible to have a skin condition, whether it's acne or psoriasis or eczema, without also having an internal biochemistry issue. That includes dry skin, that includes aging skin, wrinkled skin, hyperpigmentation, the formation of of dark spots, any of the signs of aging. It's all about the system. It's all about the internal 
part of the body. That means to eliminate skin problems, we have to address the body as a system and only then address it topically. This link between the health of the skin and the beauty and the youthfulness and attractiveness of the skin as it relates to the health and the attractiveness and the strength of the body, the entire body as a system, this is the dirty little secret of skin care. You can't have one without the other. And while this is commonsensical, when you think about it, it's not something that uh, the skincare business wants you to know about. It's not something that the purveyors of wax and oil and preservatives that we call skincare products want you to know because you're not going to be buying their products. Now, there are places that you can, uh, there is a role for topical skincare, but mostly as it relates to delivering nutrients, delivering vitamins, especially vitamin C and vitamin A. All this is to say if you want healthy skin, you got to have a healthy body. And the strategies of getting healthy skin are the same as the strategies for getting a healthy body, with the notable exception of retinol, vitamin A, and fat-soluble vitamin C. If you are spending your hard-earned dollars on department store products, drugstore products, television-type products that feature celebrity endorsements and doctors in white coats recommending their products and formulations, you're probably wasting your money. With the skin, as with the rest of the body, it all comes down to the cell. The body is really quite simple in the sense that it's all about cells and the stuff that cells make, cells and stuff. And when it comes to the skin, as with the rest of the body, having healthy skin means having healthy cells, having healthy skin cells particularly. And how do you get healthy skin cells? By feeding them the mighty 90 essential nutrients, by breathing and oxygenating and by avoiding toxicity, especially sugar. and simultaneously improving detoxification via movement, whether that's movement of the body or also movement of the skin cells. Exfoliation, for example, is a way to move skin cells. And of course, also digestive health strategies with the skin because it's located in a, an accessible fashion on the outside of the body. We can improve skin health with exfoliation techniques, with peels and with home strategies, washcloths, loofah pads, hydroxy acids, and of course, we can and we should be applying topical vitamins. As far as nutrition for the skin goes, internal nutrition for the skin goes, think fats. The skin is largely composed of fats. It's a fatty organ. Think fat absorption. That's why vitamin A is so important. It's a primal fatty vitamin. Think fatty vitamin C, fat-soluble vitamin C. Think vitamin E. Vitamin E has a protective role to play. Vitamin E internally is very important for protecting the skin from the sun. Vitamin E topically can have some protective benefits as well. A good sunscreen or sun protection product, topical sun protection product, will have vitamin E in it. It's especially, vitamin E is especially sun protective. It's protective for a lot of things, but it's especially protective against solar radiation. And then the fourth fatty vitamin, vitamin K, can be very helpful for preventing and speeding the healing of bruises. The effects of topical vitamin K on topical bruising, whether it's bruising from a wound or bruising after surgery or bruising after a skincare procedure like a laser treatment are well known, well recognized by skincare professionals. From the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, August of 2002, use of vitamin K cream after laser treatment reduces the severity of bruising, particularly in the initial days of application. That's the journal. That's from the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, August of 2002. I know this from personal, uh, personal experience. I've been formulating vitamin K, topical vitamin K wound creams for many years and getting great, great results. Vitamin K also can be helpful if you have problems with, uh, with, uh, uh, with a bru a bruising, with wounding, uh, if you have a a wound of some kind, vitamin K can also help accelerate the healing of wounded skin in addition to bruised skin. And then in addition to the fatty vitamins, you've got fatty acids, especially essential fatty acids. These play a super important role in keeping the skin healthy, especially when it comes to dry skin, which as we've said so many times in this program, is not a water problem. <clears throat> you can drink all the water you want, it isn't going to make much of a difference in your dry skin if you're not getting enough essential fatty acids, if you're not getting enough essential fats, or if you're not absorbing your essential fatty acids. If you have a gallbladder problem, intestinal problem, liver problem, and you're not absorbing your essential fats, even if you're taking them, again, you're going to have issues with dry skin. You can think of fats 
particularly butter and coconut oil too, and your ultimate EFAs, of course, as your dietary and nutritional cure. I hate that word, but if you're going to have a cure for dry skin, you can think of fats and ultimate EFAs and uh, coconut oil as cures for dry skin. I want to digress a little bit and talk briefly about oils. We'll do that when we come back from our break. All right, we are back on the bright side. I'm Pharmacist Ben. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday. 8 to 9 Pacific and 10 to 11 Central Time, 24-7 on our archive page at brightsideben.com. Got four plus years, going on five years of archives at brightsideben.com. If you miss a program or you want to review a program, they're all up there. You can also go to benfuchsarchives.com and search uh, search the website. Thank you to Peter in the UK for setting that up. Also want to encourage you to check out my blogs, pharmacistben.com and criticalhealthnews.com. Com. Of course, if you want to purchase any of the Longevity products, you can do so right off the website. You can also go to brightsideben.com, and you can also sign up to join the Brightside Ben team right off the website, or you can call the phone team at 866-735-2470, 866-735-2470. I was in uh, Mississippi last week doing a couple talks uh, for the Carries and for Lorene Williamson. Appreciate your hospitality in Mississippi. And a couple of folks asked me about oils, a whole controversy about oils, good, bad, should you eat oils, should you not eat oils? As many of you know, there's nutritionists and healthcare professionals who advise against eating oils. That includes Dr. Wallach. I've gotten a lot of questions about why I'm so fond of coconut oil, so I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes, especially considering we're talking skin health here, and oils are very, very important for the skin. So I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes to address this kind of mini controversy. First of all, here's the deal with oils. Vegetable oils in particular, grain oils, seed oils, they're very unstable. And in the world of nutrition, any time a food or a nutrient is unstable, it represents a potential problem. And this is the thinking behind the advice to stay away from oils. Oils are unstable, especially when they're processed, and that includes heat. Oil instability means highly energetic and potentially Toxic, carcinogenic, pro-aging molecules called free radicals are released from this, uh, from via the instability in oils, and they're especially released when you heat an oil. Heat is energy. Put energy into an oil, you can shake loose these free radical molecules, and this is especially a problem with older oils, so-called rancid oils, processed oils, grain, seed, nut oils are especially problematic. All vegetable oils are problematic in this sense that they're unstable. Even in the processing at the manufacturing level, instability can be created, which is why you always want to look for cold processed oils or expeller pressed oils. However, butter and coconut oil are unique in the world of oils in the sense that they're very, very stable. Butter and coconut oil can be cooked with. Butter and coconut oil don't go rancid. Coconut oil, in my opinion, is particularly amazing. Butter is also a very good oil. And in addition to them, to coconut oil and butter being stable oils, they can provide some very important, in my opinion, nutritional value, especially when it comes to skin-friendly fats. The word butter comes from the butyric acid in butter, the butyric acid content. We spent a lot of time talking about butyric acid as an uh, a, a important nutritional element. It's technically called a short fat or short chain fatty acid, if you will. It's made in the intestine by bacteria, butyric acid, the chief fatty acid in butter is very, very important for the health of the colon. It's health, important for the health of the heart. It's got appetite suppressant effects. Coconut oil likewise doesn't have short fats, but it has, uh, it doesn't have a lot of short fats, but it has a lot of medium fats. Remember, you've got three lengths when it comes to fatty acids. You've got the long fats, essential fatty acids tend to be long fats. You've got the medium fats, which are found in coconut oil. And then you've got the short fats, which are found in butter. Short fats are important for the intestine. Uh, medium fats are also important for the intestine. Medium fats that are found in coconut oil have a relevance for the skin. And then long fats, which are found in, in most vegetable and grain oils, those are going to be important for, uh, in terms of their essential nature. They get turned into hormones, and they're important for hormone processing. Sounds to me like these things are very important, and they are very important. But it's the instability that is the problem. That's why butter and coconut oil are so helpful, because in addition to being stable, you also get these important, uh, important nutritional fats and especially important skin-friendly fats. 
In any case, if you don't get enough oils in your diet, you're going to find yourself craving fatty foods because the drive for fats is hardwired into our bodies. That's why it's important to use fats preventatively. Likewise with salt, by the way. The drive for salt is also hardwired into our body. So if you try to go low salt, it's almost impossible because we're compelled to eat salt. Salt's highly electrical. Likewise with essential fats. We're compelled to eat fats. That's why it's so difficult to go low fat. Personally, I've used coconut oil and butter liberally my entire life and my ultimate EFAs, generously, 9 to 12 a day for years. And I've never had dry skin. And I've never needed a moisturizer. I'm 55 years old. I've never used a moisturizer. My skin isn't dry anywhere. Now, as far as why I have a different opinion than other nutritionists, it really is much ado about nothing. I have my own opinion. There's no textbook and there's no factoid or encyclopedia that tells you, yes, fats, no fats. When it comes to nutrition, when it comes to the uh, nutritional value of fats, when it comes to how we address our dietary needs, our supplemental needs, we really have much bigger fish to fry than worrying about whether one nutritionist says yay or one another nutritionist says nay. For us to worry about oils when we have all the health challenges we have, it's like uh, autoimmunity and uh, obesity and blood sugar problems and accelerated aging, for us to worry about whether an oil is good or bad. It's like worrying about a mosquito flying around your head when you have an elephant flying around your roof. And this is the point of what I call the bright side philosophy, which is the idea that we have control over our health. If you eat an oil, if you eat vegetable oils and, uh, or any kind of oil for that matter, and you don't feel good, you probably have a problem absorbing that oil. In any case, you're going to have to eat oil. There's no way to get around it. And when nutritionists tell you not to eat oils, they're giving you their opinions. And at the end of the day, we should all be forming our own opinion. Now, of course, Dr. Wallach has the advantage of having worked with thousands of patients and researching for 50 or 60 years. I'm still relatively wet behind the ears. I've only been researching for 30 years. But I got a certain amount of experience as well. And ultimately, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, which is to say you got to decide for yourself. I'm sharing with you my opinion. Other nutritionists, including Dr. Wallach, are sharing with you their opinions. And that's pretty much all it is. It's our opinions. And you got to form your own opinion. Take all the facts, assess them for yourself, test things out in your body, see how you feel, and make your own opinions. I hate the term doctor's orders or my doctor put me on or my doctor wants. We have this idea in the world of health that we don't know as much as our doctors do or we don't know as much as professionals do. We have to make our own opinions. We got to weigh all the facts, assess all the facts, first accumulate the facts and then assess them and, and weigh them out and then test things out. All right, so enough of that. Back to keeping our skin healthy. I've been studying skin for a long time, and as a pharmacist, compounding pharmacist, I formulated and dispensed countless, I mean countless, of my own skincare formulations for aging skin, wrinkled skin, dry skin, rashy skin, burnt skin, post-surgical skin, wounded skin. And what I've come to realize is that the strategies for keeping the skin healthy, the strategies for healing wounded skin are exactly the same as the strategies for preventing aging and wrinkles and dryness. Wound healing equals anti-aging. Wound healing equals health. What is wound healing really but stimulating the growth of things? That's what health is about. Stimulating the growth of fibers, stimulating the activity or the production of proteins from cells. It's the same thing. Wound healing is anti-dryness. Wound healing is anti-aging. Wound healing is anti-darkness or anti-pigmentation, hyperpigmentation. Wound healing is anti-wrinkle. Wound healing strategy, stimulating the growth of cells and stuff, is exactly what we want in topical skin care. If you can't put your, your moisturizer, anti-aging, anti-wrinkle product on a wound and get accelerated healing, what is that saying about your, your uh, anti-aging product? All right, we'll finish up when we come back from our break and take your phone calls as well. I'm Pharmacist Ben, 844-236. All right, we are back on the bright side. Pharmacist Ben here, 844-236-6010 is our number. Get your calls here in just a second. I want to say, well, let's say, talk about wound healing. I guess we'll talk about wound healing tomorrow. I uh, just want to emphasize the fact that pretty much everything we like about a skincare product or everything we want in a skincare product in one way or another involves the growth of tissue the growth of stuff, which is exactly the same thing you want when you have a wound. And it's exactly the same thing you want from a product that's going to help you heal a wound. 
If you can't put your anti-aging wrinkle product on a wound and get accelerated healing, what is that telling you about your anti-aging product? about your wrinkle, uh, anti-wrinkle product. Wrinkles are, uh, anti-wrinkle products are supposed to stimulate the growth of fibers, collagen and such, and such, and that's exactly what you want with a wound healing product. If you can't put your anti-aging product on a wound and get accelerated healing from a wound, that's an anti-aging product that isn't going to do much for anti-aging. You know, when you put your wrinkle product, your anti-wrinkle product on your skin, you can't really tell if it's intact, if your skin is intact. You can't really tell if you're stimulating collagen or stimulating, uh, stimulating the production of uh, connective tissue fibers, which is anti-wrinkle, which is what an anti-wrinkle product is supposed to do. You can't really tell. But if you put it on a wound, you can have a, 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 an instant window to what's happening inside the skin. If you can put it on a wound and you get stimulated healing of that wound, then you know that you're going to get stimulated, um, uh, accelerate the production or turn on the production of anti-wrinkle connective tissue fibers as well. That's why vitamin C and retinol are so darn important. You can put them on wounds and you're going to get an accelerated healing of the wounds. Now you've got to be somewhat careful with the retinol because it's so aggressive. But certainly once you have the, the wound pretty much covered, a little bit of retinol can go a long way towards accelerating the healing and repair and growth of skin cells, of connective tissue fibers, and as it turns out, also moisture factors as well. You can't put the retinol right on a wound. It's super, super stimulating, but you sure can put vitamin C on, at least fatty vitamin C on a wound and get accelerated healing of the wound. And that's your guarantee that these are the ingredients that are going to be used by the skin to get you anti-wrinkle and anti-aging benefits as well. Tomorrow we're going to talk about something called hyaluronic acid. Many of you, if not most of you, have heard of hyaluronic acid, at least in terms of internally. Hyaluronic acid can be used topically, but it has to be used topically in a strategic fashion. I don't want to say used topically. It could be stimulated topically. If you put just hyaluronic acid from a, a skincare product right on top of the skin, you're not going to get much benefit. But if you use ingredients that turn on or stimulate your skin cells production of your own high hyaluronic acid, then you're talking, then you're getting some serious anti-aging skin benefits. Anyway, we'll talk about how important this high hyaluronic acid stuff is. And also, we'll tell you why high hyaluronic acid is one of the most important detoxifying ingredients you can use in a supplemental, oral supplemental fashion. We'll do all that tomorrow as we continue talking skin health and skin health and more on the bright side. All right, 844-236-6010 is our number. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. Let's go to Keith in New Jersey. Welcome. What's up, Keith? Yeah, ben, I have two questions for you. Sure. What could a, a person do if they have a slight heart murmur? Okay. And also, if a person had a, a calcium score of 307, what could they use to... Uh, sort of uh, remove the calcium from their arteries? Well, there's a lot of things. First of all, uh, let's take the second question first. Uh, that's, it's actually a very common complaint, calcium deposits. Calcium metabolism is super tightly controlled by the body. When calcium starts to leak into the blood, you've got some chemical problems, chemistry problems, biochemistry problems. You don't have a calcium problem, you've got a biochemistry problem. For whatever reason, calcium is starting to leach out of the bones and calcium is not being taken into the cells correctly and this usually involves toxicity. When the blood becomes super, super toxic, when the blood becomes saturated with poisons, especially sugar and other, other um, elements, other toxins, stuff starts to precipitate out. Calcium can precipitate out. This is the cause of calcium crystals. Toxicity in the blood, especially sugar. This is the main cause of calcium crystals. Also, when the blood becomes acidic, or when the body becomes acidic, when the fluids become acidic, calcium is leached out of the bones as the body attempts to raise the pH. Calcium has an alkalinizing effect. So between toxicity in the blood and acidity, which is also a form of toxicity, this is the main cause of calcium deposits. To compound all of this, when the uh, blood vessels become weak, the body will use calcium as a sort of band-aid among other things, also use cholesterol and other stuff to kind of patch up uh, cuts and weaknesses in blood vessels. So between weaknesses in blood vessels and toxicity and acidity, this is where calcium deposits come from. Now you can use vitamin K to help 
attracts stick calcium to the bones. Cal vitamin K is kind of a calcium magnet and attracts calcium to the bones. Vitamin D can improve the absorption of calcium into cells. But as long as you have the problem with toxicity, especially sugar and perhaps a lack of oxygen, you're going to have an issue with calcium. So uh, use vitamin K for sure. Uh, 100 mic uh, th I'm sorry, 1,000 to 5,000 micrograms of vitamin K2 a day. Probiotic bacteria can help you make vitamin K. Make sure you're getting some sunshine to get your vitamin D. Make sure you're using your ultimate essential fatty acids as well. You get some vitamin D there. And those are all strategies for helping keep calcium out of the blood. But most importantly, you want to consider calcium deposits as a sign that your sugar metabolism is starting to uh, get thrown off and that you may have an oxygen problem and that you may have a general toxicity problem. If you're on prescription drugs, that could be a, a cause of toxicity. If you're uh, subsisting on the standard American diet, in addition to sugar, there's all kinds of um, excitotoxins and other toxic elements in the food. You got to watch that, uh, watch out for that as well. If you have digestive problems, especially if you're constipated, that can cause problems with toxicity. And then uh, making sure you're practicing your deep breathing techniques. So healthy start pack, vitamin K. When I say vitamin K, I'm also including probiotics in addition to around 1,000 to 5,000 uh, micrograms of vitamin K2, vitamin D through your essential fatty acids, and also making sure that you're uh, getting some sunshine uh, on a regular basis, and then, uh, and then making sure that you're taking care of your sugar needs, especially if you know you have diabetes or diabetes in the family or you got sugar cravings or you have any of the other signs of diabetes, including weight gain and, and blood pressure problems. Are you, are you, uh, is this making sense, by the way? Yes, it is. Okay, is this the same? Let me just let me just say one last thing. Let me just say one last thing. No, let me just say one last thing. Are you? Is this all for you, or is this for separate people? It's for me. Okay, so the heart murmurs are a sign that uh, that the blood there's a, there's some kind of weird something going on with uh, with blood flow. It could be a narrowing of the valves or leaking of the valves, and blood blood is not making it through the valves correctly. Uh, there, it has to do with how fl blood is flowing through the heart, basically, and it could be related to the calcium deposits. So all of these are going together. The heart murmur is linked to the calcium deposits and calcification. They're all circulatory problems, blood problems. So a couple other things that uh, if you have heart murmurs and have calcium deposits. That's telling me a couple other things that you might that I want to uh, bring up with you. I didn't mean to interrupt. What were you saying? I was just going to say that I have like a low pH, so I guess that's also caused by maybe uh, toxicity in the body. Well, how do you know you have a low pH? And yes, that's correct. But how do you know you have a low pH? Yeah, uh, like a urine uh, sample. Have you done it? You're, yeah, you're, your urine was low. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, it's all related. It's all related, to, and the heart murmurs are all related as well. Some is percolating in your circulatory system. I want to ask you a couple more questions, so don't go away. Uh, but you have a bunch of good information there. Uh, but let me ask you a couple more questions and, and maybe fine-tune my answer a little bit, so don't go away. I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. Hang tight if you're on hold. We'll get to you when we come back from our break. Don't go away. You're listening to The Bright Side. All right, we're back on the bright side. I am Pharmacist Ben. 844-236-6010 is our number. We're talking to Keith in New Jersey about calcium deposits and heart murmurs. Uh, calcification and the uh, uh, heart murmurs both have to do with circulation. Both have to do uh, with how blood is flowing, how blood is flowing through the body. Usually the heart goes boom, 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 boom. But if you get the swishing sound... <laughs> That's what's called a heart murmur. It can be related to the thyroid. It could be related to uh, uh, problems with uh, anemia. It could be related to problems with the heart having to work too hard. It can be related to valve problems, et cetera, et cetera. But, but basically, you're looking at an issue of toxic blood. The fact that calcium deposits are occurring in the same patient as heart murmurs tells me 100% you're dealing with toxic blood. Keith also tells us that his urinary pH is low. All of these are indicators that there's toxicity in the blood. The most important toxic in, toxin in the blood is sugar, and it's the one that we have the most control over. I'm not sitting here talking about sugar to beat up on, you know, because I'm Mr. Healthcare guy. I'm just saying that if you got a biochemical problem, if you have a health issue, the chances are pretty darn good if you're subsisting on the SAD, the SAD, the standard American diet, that you got a sugar problem. 
heart murmurs, calcification, tell me something's, something's percolating in the circulatory system. More than likely sugar is involved. Oxygen's also involved. Make sure you're practicing your deep breathing techniques, restricting your caloric intake, sugar intake, increasing oxygenation, all will have a thinning effect on the blood, and that can have a positive benefit for uh, for heart murmurs, and it can also have an, uh, help you improve the uh, calcium deposits as well. I'm sorry, Keith, go ahead now. You were going to ask me something? Oh, 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 great. You pretty much have answered all my uh, questions there, Ben. Good deal. And, uh, Slow I, I don't deal. assume as much sugar as it is, but I'll just eliminate it completely. Well, it's sneaky. Sugar is very, very sneaky. Bread, pasta, potatoes, uh, even ketchup and mustard. and you know, It's everywhere. It's really hard okay. to, to get away from it. But you go by your symptoms. Calcification doesn't necessarily mean that you're dealing with a sugar problem, but the odds are pretty good. A heart murmur doesn't necessarily mean that you're dealing with a sugar problem, but the odds are pretty good. Being an American in the year 2015 doesn't necessarily mean that you have a sugar problem. Problem, but the chances are pretty good. You know, all of it, all of this is to say that the chances are pretty good you got a sugar problem because we all do, and that's just how it is. All yeah, right. Deep breathing exercises. What should, what should you do with that? Like several times a day? Just as much there. as you can do it, but at least yes, at least several times a day. And all, all you have to do is two or three minutes. You'll know. Do you have a blood pressure cuff? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, well, you'll know when you've, when you've gotten the, the benefits of deep breathing because you're going to feel really relaxed, and it only takes one or two deep breaths. 30 seconds on a breath, 15 in, 15 out, or actually 14 in, 16 out to be technical, but uh, 30 seconds on, a, on an inhale, exhale cycle, uh, two breaths a minute. You could do it for three minutes, six breaths. You'll feel like a new man. Oh, All right? Great. That's Thank you, buddy. It, ben. Take care, Keith. Have a good day. Where in New Jersey are you, by the way? In Absecon. Absecon. Is that that's must be near new, near New York? No, it's near Atlantic City. Oh, okay. All right, good. Have a good day, man. Okay. Thank you, Keith. All right, Robert in Colorado. What's going on, man? Oh, it's just a lovely day. It's not raining. It's beautiful. I think it's going to rain later, though. <laughs> hey, Ben, What's I that? was originally going to ask you about sunburn since I seem to be getting my head head burned all the time. But I have a lady that I'm working with. Um, she was she was. To, uh, came down with the symptoms of chronic lymphotic le lymphocytic leukemia in 1991, and in her description, fear for her life prevented full recovery. It's suspected that she has... Say that again? Uh, fear for her life prevented fear. full... Right, and I've talked to another person that says she's suffering, believes there she's suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, so I'm thinking okay. we've got something along those lines, and I'm wondering if you, if you could address um, the leukemia and possibly the, maybe the treatment has done something to her uh, mental capacity. Could be. Could be, absolutely. I don't know what she was on, but any drug can affect your brain, you know. Right, right. So it's not, I, I can't say for sure, but that's definitely a possibility. CLL, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia is a type of there cancer. It's a, uh, it's a white blood cell cancer, basically, but it's cancer. So what's the deal with cancer? Cancer is a sign of a cell, whether it's a white blood cell or a bone cell or a liver cell or an intestinal colon cell, whatever, lung cell, whatever the cell it is, whatever type of cancer it is, it's a sign that cells are freaked out. This is so important because it simplifies everything. You know, really, we got 12,800 different diseases. We got medical libraries everywhere. We got doctors everywhere. We're the most medicalized culture in the history of the planet. And we're sicker than ever before because we've missed the basics. The basics are disease is disease. It's right in the word. It's a lack of ease. It's a sign of burden, period burden. Now, there's two ways you can have a burden. You can have a burden from what you're doing, and you can have a burden from what you're not doing. And both sides of the equation have to be addressed. Cancer is like a classic example of what happens no matter what your problem is. It's a classic example of a dis-ease, a cell dis-ease. A cell will only become cancerous when it is at its, it's at its wit's end. It has no other options. It doesn't know how else to process energy. It is so uh, starved of oxygen. It is so starved of micronutrients. It is so toxic and swimming in its own toxicity, including sugar, that it doesn't know how else to deal with life. So cancer... Or, uh, uh, cell division, cells will divide super rapidly in order to somehow be able to get enough energy. The problem is when they divide so rapidly, they're non-functional and they become energy hogs. They go from not being able to utilize energy to sucking up energy wherever it is. And people will die of starvation. Cancer cells steal our nutrients. That's how we die of cancer. Our cancer cells steal all our nutrients. 
So once a cell turns cancerous, it's like a switch has been turned. It's not a, it, it builds up gradually and then a switch is turned. So in order to take care of cancer, this is so important to understand, and it's logical when you think about it, because a cancer cell is our cell, Robert. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's yeah. not a foreign invader that has come into the body. It's our own cells. So the way to address cancer is not to kill the cancer unless you have no other option and, and you're in an emergency condition. The way you address cancer is by addressing the environment that the cells are living in. Can this be done? Yes. Remissions occur. Remissions are a known fact. And many people believe that there's more remissions than we know about because people don't often go back to the doctor if they've remitted. So remissions, cancer remissions happen. And if it happens to one person, if it can happen in one body, it can happen to anybody. And the way you do a cancer's remit is not by changing the cell. Once a cell is cancerous, that particular cell isn't going to switch back. It's the new cells that you got to take care of. And the way you take care of the new cells is by taking care of the context. Now, you mentioned about the belief systems, and that's very important. And I, I don't talk about it on this program anywhere near enough, but I plan to. I plan to be talking a lot more about belief systems and the spiritual and mental and emotional components of good health because it is much more than physical. Yeah. And the belief systems change the context every bit as much as, as toxicity from foods change the context or the environment that the cell is living in. Read Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief, if you want a really good explanation of the relationship between genetics and the cells and the environment that the cells are living in. He's very clear about it. The cells turn on and off. The, cell product, uh, the genes of the cell turn on and off based on what's happening in the environment that the cell is in. You change the environment that the cell's in, you change to the genetics. If you change it enough, you'll get a cancerous cell. So you've got to clean the body first. This is why caloric restriction, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know how many times, I, I, I don't know, I hope I'm not boring anybody with this idea about fasting and caloric restriction and keeping your sugar intake down, but it is unbelievably helpful, important for healing, for anti-aging, for slowing down the production of cancer, prevent, for preventing cancer, even reversing cancer. So caloric restriction, practice fasting. As much as she can fast, caloric restriction and fasting. Now, she does need her nutrients, and there's a distinction between caloric restriction and optimum nutrition. You've got to make sure you're getting your nutrients, especially your micronutrients. Micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, that's it, that is, and essential fatty acids and amino acids, too. Micronutrients help the body use calories. It's the proportion or the ratio of calories to micronutrients that count. So you want lots of micronutrients and not as much calories. Natural foods, whole foods, will have a, a, a healthy balance of, uh, of macronutrients or of calories to micronutrients. This is what makes a whole food so valuable, and this is what makes junk food so, uh, so problematic. Junk food is actually lots of calories and nowhere near enough micronutrients. Whole foods are just the perfect proportion of micronutrients to, to calories. Anyway, caloric restriction, fasting. Uh, don't forget about the importance of oxygenation. Make sure she's practicing deep breathing techniques. Even hyperbaric oxygen, high pressure oxygen can be helpful for dealing with cancer. And then, of course, micronutrients are super important. If it was me, I would personally be using intravenous micronutrients, especially the B vitamins, especially something called glutathione, which we've talked about many times in this program, which is the body's primary cancer fighter, especially something called selenium chelation therapy can also be helpful for cancer, chelating heavy metals out of the body. So many different strategies you can use. Certainly, the Healthy Start Pack is important, and probiotics, the Biolumin Nightly Essence can be helpful. There's also a really cool relationship between enzymes and cancer. Digestive enzymes in particular, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez has written a lot about this. Pancreatic enzymes are particularly helpful. So much you can, so much you can do, Robert, and then, uh, as you pointed out, astutely, don't underestimate the belief component. All right, that's all the time we have for today. I'm Pharmacist Ben. Thanks. 